Thank you for getting here. <laughs> I know how it you know, goes getting to places, right? Your backpacks, your water, tea. So I'm going to play the Tibetan bell first. It was a gift from a friend to bring us into the room. Thank you all so much for coming, for being here. It is an honor to be able to share with you all and to be with you this afternoon. Susie and I are thrilled because it's also a really special time in a, a body of work that we've been working on for a while. We have a new book coming out called Your Story is Your Power, Free Your Feminine Voice. And today, we are thrilled to get to share some of the work from inside of this book with you. The book comes out on March 9th, so this is like a, an advanced pre-release. And this is the first time that we're together getting to share this work, so thank you. Um, there are actually some very early advanced copies in the bookstore. I believe there are about 30. So um, if you want to dive deeper into some of the things that we're talking about today, we invite you to go check it out. There's also a bookmark on your seat that has information about um, if you'd like to order one and have it sent to your house when it comes out. Pardon? Oh, and Susie and I signed all of the copies that are here. <laughs> Good to know. So we, um, if that's what you want. yeah, if that's what you want, I think, oh yeah. So our hope for writing this book and our hope for being here today with you is uh, we want to talk about feminine power, something that we see emerging on the global stage. We saw it last week with the incredible young girls stepping forward in Florida after the incredible massacre. Their voice is just so strong and so pure and coming forward and really saying what they thought and how they felt. We see it happening around dinner tables at the holidays. We see it happening in our most intimate relationships. We see it happening within our own internal worlds. And our hope for this book and our hope for this session is to spiral into the center of our story, um, to have practices that we can utilize in our everyday uh, life that will help us understand how to access our own feminine power so that you can share your gifts and your feminine power, which we need now more than ever, whether you're a man or a woman, we need your feminine power on the global stage. So it is our hope to, um, to begin spiraling and beginning that process. And maybe, Susie, can you tell us a little bit more about spirals? I can. How many of you here have walked a labyrinth? Ah, oh, perfect. <laughs> Well, we used the labyrinth as a metaphor in the book, and um, it's got two combined symbols in it, uh, the spiral and the meander. And um, a spiral uh, is a symbol that they found in cave paintings up to like 30,000 years ago, and it's a symbol that means going inward. And then the other one is a meander, and the meander is symbolic of it takes time. Anybody here see Groundhog Day? <laughs> things take time to digest. And one of the things that you might note, and a lot of you who are in you know, train, you know, practices of some kind, whether it's meditation or yoga or psychotherapeutic, know that you think, oh, maybe I've gotten somewhere, and then you feel like you're just back at where you began. That's the meander, and it's the part of us that takes time to digest and take in the journey and what we're learning. 
And there are, in both the, the spiral and the meander, you can see them in nature everywhere. The spiral in a nautilus shell, the meander in our intestines. It's part of our natural movement. Susie, can I add that there are meanders all over these yeah. walls? <laughs> we had that done. <laughs> The, the labyrinth originally was designed, actually the one in Chartres was originally designed for people that couldn't go to Jerusalem. And so it was a way for people to have an experience of a journey inside the cathedral. Now, you're probably wondering why we put goldfish on your chair. And I mean, you know, in this time of gluten-free and dairy-free, we apologize. <laughs> there is a... Um, a neuroscientist by the name of David Eagleman, and we want to quote him because it, it sort of encapsulates what it is that we're trying to understand about ourselves. We are like fish challenged to understand water. Since the fish has never experienced anything else, it is almost impossible for it to see or conceive of the water. But a bubble rising past the inquisitive fish can offer a critical clue. The idea is, is when we start to step into the story and look at those parts of the story that stave us off from what we really think or what we really want to express, then we can start to get a sense of what the water is about. And bringing that to consciousness is the challenge. So one of the things that Elle and I bring up in the book that we noticed in our personal journeys and noticed also working with women is that the fairy tale is a big chunk of the water um, early on. Fairy tales are unconsciously designed to carry on knowledge on how to be. And so when you talk to a little girl often, you'll, you'll see that she'll want to wear a princess crown, right? Because in fairy tales, in order to be successful, you need to be beautiful princess to get the good looking prince. That's the old fairy tale. So what we noticed was, was that the fairy tale Looking at the fairy tales enable us to see more about the water. The second arena to look at, because we're all, you know, people of the media, and in the media, right, we see commercials all the time. And I don't know if you, any of you know who Edward Bernays is. He was Freud's nephew, and he dis he used what Freud what Freud found in psychology to be successful in advertising. And he figured that instead of describing a product, which is, was the old way of advertising, right? You, you, you buy a car, let me tell you about it. But he figured that if you couple it with an image or a concept, then you sell more products. Like if you put a beautiful woman next to a car, a lot of people tend to buy a car. So with cigarettes, what he discovered was the way to get people to smoke, there was a whole population of people that didn't smoke, which were women. The men did the smoking. So he coupled the cigarette with the idea of freedom and got women to stop eating and to start smoking and called them torches of freedom so that women would buy cigarettes. And it worked. Crowd psychology, it worked. These are two very powerful mediums. The other one is our TV shows and earlier than that, radio shows. And one of the things that I remember um, from TV is that when I was a kid, we watched cartoons on Saturday mornings, and we watched TV shows like Marvel Comics, which are now you know, big in the movies. And what I remembered from the Batman series, anybody here remember the early Batman series with Adam West? Okay. And the red phone, love the red phone. <laughs> and the Batmobile. Um, was that there was an episode where women took over Gotham City. And when the women took over Gotham City, Nothing got done because they were all looking in the mirror, putting their lipstick on. Okay? So these are the things that I ingested as a child and anybody of that era did, right? And this is, these are the cultural waters. This is what surrounds us, right? As we learn about ourselves and what we can say and what we cannot say. So these are the things that we focused on in the book. In the book, The Hidden Brain, the author speaks with Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And Justice Ginsburg um, talks about these cultural waters and how she experienced them and her own process 
of becoming more, much more aware of them later in life. And she said, and we quote, when Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg went to law school at Columbia in the 1950s, there were no women's bathrooms in the building. If nature called, she said, you had to make a mad dash to another building that had a woman's bathroom. It was even worse if you were in the middle of an exam. But we never complained. It never occurred to us to complain. What we would like for you to do with one of the post-it notes in your seat, if you have a pen as well, handy, or you can share with a pal next to you if they have one, Make a friend. Or you can also make a mental note. Or a mental note, yes. We would love to give you a chance to write down maybe just a few, a few minutes. Um, top of mind, there's no right or wrong answer. What are things that come up for you that you've experienced, the cultural waters of your life? Um, specifically, were there any moments in time when you saw discrimination against women? Maybe it was um, your mom, or maybe it was something against another woman. Maybe it was um, with your wife, your sister, a friend, or yourself. Take a moment and please jot down what comes to mind on the post-it. And if some of the men in the room uh, are struggling with that one, also, if there was a time when you were told that you couldn't be feminine for whatever reason. Now we invite you to turn to the person next to you or near you and share what came up on your post-it. One thing that we wanted to bring up before uh, the comments, before we get comments, is that yesterday when I was here, I got to hear Tarana Burke speak. How many of you got to hear her talk? Mm. I have to say that I'm 55, but I want to be like her when I grow up, you know? <laughs> Amazing. Um, one of the things that we wanted to bring up, um, it, this is such a timely issue, and her work is so incredible. And one of the things that really struck me about what she said was making safety, it's safe for people to speak. Yeah. And so these exercises that we're doing today are gonna help you if you wanna do this, is make your internal world safe so that you can speak to yourself. Okay, thanks. We would love to have one, two, maybe three Folks, share what came up. We have a microphone here, which we can bring to you. Um, and uh, why don't we start off with a gentleman? Thank you. Hi, thanks. Uh, in, uh, in the Jewish uh, religion, uh, Orthodox Jews, and growing up in Israel, I, I was a fish in the water. I didn't know that there is conservative and reform I knew there is synagogue, and that's, those are the rules. So the men get to uh, sit uh, in the front uh, and uh, do the, manage all the prayers in the, in the holy area where the ark is and the, the holy books. And uh, women are not permitted there. Wow. Women would sit wow. around 
or mm. above. And it would be not, not permitted even for a, a, a little girl we would play around and one of my friends would run in to the wrong place and she would be wow. expelled. <laughs> um, so uh, that's something that, and I have deep value to tradition and religion and, uh, and anything spiritual, but that for me is, has nothing to do with anything except uh, wrong because a person is a person. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a waving hand in the back. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. OK. Oh, sorry. Um, for me, what came up, and a big thing that I'm experiencing in my personal life, is this transactional relationship that we have with men, that in relationship, if a man shows up and is providing for us in some way, even if it's simply buying dinner, that there's these subtle, built-up expectations that come with that offering of love, and ultimately it being sex and that we are not allowed to say no if somebody has shown up and offered for us and given us love. And that subtle transaction that is so hard for us to break through because it's not spoken about. So that is a huge thing that's coming up in my life and important to address, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Can I take a waving hand? Another waving hand. <laughs> cool. Hello, thank you. Um, I was at uh, university almost 40 years ago, and I was attacked in the aisles at the NYU Law School. Mm. And what was stunning was two ladies came up to me whispering, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, were you just attacked? I said, yes. And they said, okay, me too, I was just attacked. I said, why are you whispering? I wasn't sure if I was attacked or if I imagined it. I said, what do you do? I said, I am a lawyer. I said, what do you do? I am also a lawyer. Mm. I said, they are both lawyers and didn't know if they were attacked or imagined it. Let me tell you, the man threw me against the bookshelves and, I knock, and he knocked me out. I fell on the floor like an egg. I knew I was attacked. It's, this is no, this is, we are so confused about yeah. boundaries. And I just want to say it's okay to have boundaries. Even if the other person is in pain who's attacking, yeah. it's okay to have boundaries. I love, thank you. That's right. Thank you. This will be our, our last one, although these are amazing and we hope you'll continue to share these after the session. I, um, <clears throat> I worked in engineering, and um, I was a director in engineering, and I was probably one out of 10 of women who were in engineering, and one out of probably 30 who were in management. And I, it was like I could not be my authentic self. I had to be either a man, I had to be an invented self. And I remember one incident where there was this golf tournament or this golf event formulated, and a man who was, and the upper management had formed, had formed this event. And the people who worked for me, these men who worked for me were invited, and I didn't even know about it until after it happened. And it was for all the management staff, supposedly. And I didn't, I wasn't even told. Mm -hmm. And that's why today it's like I'm so passionate about women in the workforce, especially in engineering and in fields where they're minority, is to just be able to know how to be and how to be their authentic self and be accepted and recognized for their accomplishments and, and not have to be what I lived, which is just always wondering how do I act, who do I be, what do I need to be, and sometimes acting like a man and then having to unravel myself for the last, I don't know, 15 years since I've been out of it to just try to figure out who the heck I am and how I was created and who I am today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. 
we have some more we want to cover, so we're going <laughs> to move forward. But we could do this all weekend. We, and we did it for a long period of time ourselves. <laughs> so. Yes. So just as we're all a part of a cultural water, we're also a part of our family systems. And um, I, have a, I have a cute, a very, very cute little Cocker Spaniel dog. Her name is Tilly. She's white with red spots. And um, if you have a dog, maybe you've seen the dog like circle around before they lay down to go to sleep. So this is um, something that's passed down um, from dog to dog that uh, is really just how a long time ago they would mat the grass down in a field before laying down in the grass. So in a similar way, um, the psychotherapist and professor, or psychologist and professor Murray Bowen, he discovered that we pass things down generation to generation. So we would like to turn a little bit and look at our family systems, which um, Carl Jung called our family systems and the questions, the unanswerable questions that continue to come up. He called them the impersonal karma within a family. When uh, I was writing, writing Aphrodite Emerges, which is the title of the book, um, one thing I noticed in my family was that the women always seemed to have this slight shake whenever they were confronted or they looked afraid. And I also realized internally that I was afraid that I was going to get killed for speaking out. And I thought, where does that come from? Because there was no physical domestic violence in my family. There was no history of some woman buried out in the backyard or anything. So I didn't know why I would carry that and why my you know, cousins and my aunts had this kind of look about them. And so we went through the family lineage and I found out that I had four direct ancestors involved in the Salem witch trials. And two of them, one was the constable who went around um, uh, arresting all the individuals. And the other one was the marshal who, or maybe it was the other way around. But anyway, the one, one led the trials and one arrested everybody. And then there was one that was actually a victim. And then also a couple in the, in the witness stand. I mean, in the jury. <laughs> so I really started to understand how long like how many generations you can carry some of these family transmission processes and how important it was to identify it. And I since then have had conversations with my family members and they all had this sense of relief when they, when they figured this out. Oh, that's me, I'm next. <laughs> okay, looking at her, right? All right, so our question to you today and you can put this on your post-it notes as well, which is, how have your family dynamics impacted you now? What have you noticed? <laughs> okay, this is gonna take a month. Um, <laughs> You need more post-it notes. You know that saying about why do, do family, or why does your family get to push your buttons? Well, they installed them. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So what have you noticed? And just a few things um, about your, how your family's impacted you. Like one or two sentences would be fine. If you want to put 60 later, that's, that's the work in the book. Thanks. And some of the questions you might ask are, um, what role did your dad play in the house? What role did your mom play? Um, who's in charge? Why? We'll let you take it from there. Okay. Um, now, if you would turn, and you can use the same partner or pick a new one, but turn to somebody and share with what, them what you've written down, if you would. Okay, now, as we did before, we're going to have a mic brought around to you if you uh, raise your hand. And I saw someone here on the end here that had her, yeah, you, her, right, right there, yes, her, yes. And, it, you know, stand up, yeah, there we go, great, thanks. Hi, I'm the youngest of five, and um, 
my, bro my oldest brother and I are six years apart, so he must have been 10 and I was four. And I remember at four him saying, um, my last name's Kelly. He's like, you're not a Kelly. You don't look like a Kelly. You don't sound like a Kelly. You don't even smell like a Kelly. <laughs> you don't belong to this family. Go down the hall and then look in the, in the cabinet where all the baby books are. You don't have a baby book. See, that proves wow. it. And I remember it at four because I still, when I'm with my family, feel like I don't belong and wow. I don't fit mm -hmm. and I won't ever fit. So that's mm -hmm. still with me. Still in prayer. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Thank okay. You. We have someone right here. Hi. Hi. Um, well, exactly to your point, the list can go on, but one thing that I want to pick and share um, is I just realized that uh, with all the emotions we all go through and that even in my family, the one that was allowed to be expressed was anger. So everybody happily and willfully, you know, shouts and screams. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a well practiced, uh, well allowed expression, mm -hmm. and what I did not learn or um, see examples of was kindness. Oh, uh huh. And, and people who know me know I'm a very kind, compassionate person, but I realized that. I didn't see it, and that's been my life's work, is to learn how to be kind first to myself and to others, so thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Anyone else? Right there. Which one? Third person in, there you go, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, so my, my father was a dictator. Uh, he was a full-time breadwinner and my mother didn't have an opportunity for higher education, and then she had to quit her job after she had three children. And there was a lot of domestic violence. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Physical, verbal, and psychological. And, and I'm a survivor of a child abuse, mm -hmm. domestic violence. And then I, I left home at the age of 17 because my oh, father okay. assaulted me. So I got nearly killed, so I had to just run to survive. And then afterwards, um, I tried so hard to um, build a nurturing relationship so I could get married and create a family of my own that is safe, that, that I would be fulfilled, but it didn't happen. Uh, one after another, the relationship just went on, um, turned out to be abusive. So I continued to feel hurt, and then, and then realized that it was just kind of it's like a running up uh, the cycle repeatedly. Mm -hmm. That's how I got into uh, the therapy, and I'm in, in the process of integrated healing uh, to end that generational, um, I don't know, trauma. To mm -hmm. mm. so, like end it with me, and then not repeat it anymore. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for doing the work. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to share? Hi, I'm Marie. Um, I am from a family of lonely m women. Um, I was conceived by my mother and my father who ran away. Uh, she was conceived by her mom and the father was a married man. Mm. My grandmother, my great grandmother, was left al alone when the kids were like six, five, and four by her husband. So it's in 1918, right before the first war. And my great grandmother was widow and pregnant with her daughter. So I've been lived all my life with like women are supposed to be alone, oh, and men are all sorry, but men are all jerks and mm. whatever. Sorry, guys, <laughs> I don't <laughs> think that. Um, so and I have divorced, so I'm alone, and I have two daughters. Oh, wow. So what I feel now is we can break that circle because I've been working on it, mm. um, although I am not, I am single right now, so <laughs> it's very emotional. Um, yeah. mm. And I think the role as a mom also is not to pass on mm. that. 
And I think it's important as women, if we have issues, is to really protect our daughters if we have daughters. And um, that's my everyday work. Mm. I think it's important to break the cycles. And I think we are lucky enough to be a generation where we have the opportunity to do that. Yes. Or mom, moms and grandmoms and everything, they didn't have that opportunity. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you thank for you. speaking. Thank you. Again, yes, we could. Um, th thank you for sharing your stories. Um, in the book, um, for the, Susie and I didn't share our stories here because we wanted to give space for other folks to talk, but you can read all about our cultural waters, and um, we've done the same exercise. So we looked at it through three lenses, the cultural water, the family water, and then the third is the personal story. And um, Susie is an Enneagram teacher and trainer, and um, so she brings a lot of the wisdom of, that, um, of the personality typology to the book. We're not going to be able to touch on it today. We wish we could, uh, but that's in there. We wanted to close with, um, we, we talked for a while about how to close because we're just, this is such a brief amount of time. It's, it, it's already over. Um, and we hope you'll continue asking these questions and having this dialogue with friends and colleagues and around the dinner table sometimes. And um, we wanted to close with a quote by Joseph Campbell. And we, um, I guess we're, we're ending where we began, which is with the labyrinth. The labyrinth is thoroughly known. We have only to follow the thread of the hero path. And where we had thought to slay another, we shall slay ourselves. Where we had thought to travel outward, we will come to the center of our own existence. And where we had thought to be alone, we will be with all the world. I wanted to, um, in saying goodbye to all of you, um, say one thing is that in, when we do circles, we hold each other's hands. And when we say at the end of the moment or the time that we're together is, I'm letting go of your hand, but I'm not leaving you. And we'd like to today just share with you that we are so happy to be part of this community of people that are so steadfast and doing this work. So I'd like to end today with the bell again and uh, say goodbye. Thank you.